Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 94 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Today, my guest will be third degree Hilson Gracie black belt, Phil Cardella. But before we get to that, let's get started with a quote, and then we'll do a meet the listener segment. Okay. The big, strong, tough guy goes to class, and he keeps getting tapped by the skinny, technical guy. It begins to change him. It makes him humble. That's what jiu-jitsu does to you. It makes you humble. And that's from none other than Master Helson Gracie. Great quote. Okay, on to the Meet the Listener segment. Today we'll be meeting and speaking with Tyson Kilby. So let's meet Tyson now. Okay, I'm speaking with Tyson Kilby. So welcome to the show, Tyson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Get us started by telling us where you're from and where you currently train. Okay, yeah. So I'm an instructor at the Overland Park, Kansas, uh, CTC, and I've been training with them since 2010, but I've been an instructor probably since 2015 with uh, Dave Johnson, Dave Smar, and those guys at the Overland Park, CTC in oh, yeah. Kansas. Great guys, great guys. <laughs> and a great place to be, for sure. So I... Yeah, yeah. Really so ask... fun school. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, it's a fun school, and in fact, one of our one of the guys we trained with, Jesse, was on another Meet the Listener segment he did with Heat on. I don't remember when it was. I remember listening to it, but he talked to you guys for quite a bit, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. Jesse's a good guy, for sure. Shout out to him. So normally I ask about what hobbies you may have off the map, but I know you recently wrote a book, so tell us about that. Yes, yeah. I, I just It hasn't even quite been two months, and I wrote Fundamental Handgun Mastery, that is jiu-jitsu, great jiu-jitsu is one of my biggest hobbies, but then so is um, firearms and shooting. I own a, a firearms company, and of course, I'm in law enforcement as well. Um, so those, those are my two main hobbies, but I just blend them you know, together so much. And I teach jiu-jitsu like I teach firearms, and I teach both like I learned from the great people. Awesome, awesome. I just helped uh, Heater on last week with the, uh, the GST and with a lot of law nice. officers, so love that, and I love the uh, yeah. merging of the two. So, uh, tell us how the book got, you know, how that idea panned out and got started for you, and and um, and then tell us a little bit about the book, who's it for, and and that kind of thing. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I keep a busy schedule. Um, you know, I train just during the days. I teach a lot of day classes, and then I have private lessons I do, and then I work evenings at the sheriff's office, so I, I get so amped up from shooting, training, teaching, and all that, so at night, you know, it was hard for me to wind down, so I was thinking about all my lessons of the day and stuff like that, so for over the last two years, I would just write, you know, stuff that I learned, things, uh, conversations I've had with students and stuff like that, and over time, it started to become more um, you know, formatted, and it was more like, oh, this is these are a lot of the things I teach my students. Let me put it together in a book, and it kind of went um, quickly. It was over two years, but then when I decided to put it in a book format, it only took me a month or so, and then put it out. And I've had a I've had a good response to it. I've been very happy with some of the messages I've got and reviews. Wonderful. I think it's really great, um, a great subject, and very much needed. You know, jujitsu is excellent and awesome, and, and 
we all love jujitsu. It's our passion. But when you can take it further, and especially for law enforcement officers, but also the general public who who do uh, decide to carry, uh, you know, learning more about what the ramifications are, about safety, about how to do it and implement things. Uh, yeah. Very vital and very uh, very needed. So hats off to you for broaching that subject. Um, what are some of the things someone could expect if they they get the book? Yeah. Well. Um, so, like I said, I teach firearms, um, like I teach jujitsu, like I learned from the Gracies. And so, it's one of those books where, let me put it this way, I've gotten, I got a message from a mom who really had never learned about firearms before, was a complete and total novice, and she said, wow, I mean, even, not only was it not over my head in terms of the terminology, I picked up so many things on awareness and so many things that I could just apply to general safety that was really valuable for me. But, and that made me feel good, but it also made me feel good. I got a text message from a, a Grandmaster class shooter, a USPSA Steel Challenge shooter, who was like, man, those are some pretty cool concepts. I even picked up a cool thing in the book. So I, I'm happy that I was able to put it into a format where it, it doesn't matter kind of what angle you're coming from, whether you're a total novice to someone who's experienced in firearms. I think because I wrote it in the kind of the jujitsu mindset and the teaching methodologies I learned from Henner, there's things that can be picked up in, in a broad group of people, right? whether it's the safety part, whether it's the, the legal aspect, whatever part you want to learn more about and take a few steps up the ladder. Um, I think I've accomplished that, and so far the reviews are, are telling me that people are liking it. And that's really great. I love how you applied that methodology that you learned and that you used for jujitsu instruction to this subject. I mean, yep. you know, teaching to the lowest common denominator, right? So nobody's yep, left behind. Of course. You know, even if you have a wonderful subject or an important subject, but you don't break it down where everybody can really assimilate it and understand it and use it, you know, you, you missed a mark. But it sounds like you really had that in mind and you made it where everyone can understand no matter where they're coming from. For sure. That was the goal, and you said it well. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm glad to hear you get yep. great reviews. Uh, where where can someone find the book? I'll, I'll definitely put a link in the, uh, the show notes, but where is it currently out being sold? Awesome. Thank you. Well, of course, you can get it in paperback and, and Amazon. Everybody shops Amazon nowadays. You can also get it. Um, it's available on ebook, Kindle. Um, and then if you go to my website, Top Firearms Instruction, there's um, links to it there as well, too. So plenty of places. Excellent. Excellent. Readily available. So, Tyson, what do you like uh, most about the podcast? Man, um, well, first of all, I look. I go to the website and I look at your guest list. And I, I, if I was to give you a podcast, I couldn't have picked a better guest list. You've had, you've had some awesome people on here. But, you know, I just the time goes by quick when I listen to this podcast, you know, be, between the quote and then sometimes you have to meet the listener and then you start talking, impact segment. It's like, man, I just... I just listened and, and learned so much stuff, and it, and it went by quick. So I'm a pretty big fan of just the whole format you got going, and I think it's just going to continue to get bigger. Uh, well, I appreciate those kind words, man. It's it's definitely definitely a passion, and um, I love getting good feedback. So thanks for being a listener. And uh, anybody that you want to shout out to before we close? Man, yeah, I only have a little bit of time. There's just so many people, cool people I've met in this journey. But, of course, all the ICP instructors, I love meeting with those guys, uh, Henner, Edom, the whole Gracie family, and then, of course, my training partner students and instructors at Overland Park, CCC, Kansas. Awesome. Well, man, thanks for doing what you uh, you do. You've obviously touched a lot of lives and impacting people in, in various different uh, levels as well as um, different uh, industries, uh, firearms as well as jiu-jitsu. So hats off to you. Keep up the good work and be well, brother. Awesome. My pleasure. Thank you very much again, Marty, for talking to you. My pleasure, sir. Take care, man. Bye. Okay, really enjoyed getting to know Tyson a bit better. And now on to our main interview. Phil Cardella is a third-degree BJJ black belt under Master Helson Gracie, as well as a third-degree black belt in Taekwondo and second-degree black belt in Hapkido. He's had a very successful jiu-jitsu competition career and was the first American fighter to represent the Helson Gracie team in MMA competition. And during his MMA career, he fought in the World Extreme Cage Fighting Organization, which I really enjoyed watching. Phil also served as an assault amphibious vehicle crewman in the United States Marine Corps, during which time he also taught primary marksmanship and combat water safety. Today, he continues to work with various branches of the U.S. military to train them in hand-to-hand combatives using BJJ. 
Phil is the founder of the Health and Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Associations in Texas and has since moved to Florida to lead his team and community as head instructor of Health and Gracie St. Augustine. During this interview, he discusses a variety of topics, including developing Health and Gracie Jiu-Jitsu in Texas, relocating to and starting his academy in Florida, his time off the mat, creating the right atmosphere for training, puppies instead of diapers, training with his brothers, his jiu-jitsu competition and MMA career, and what he's most proud of, and more. So I know you're going to enjoy this interview. After the interview, make sure you stick around for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. And now, without further ado, let's talk to Phil. Okay, I'm speaking with Phil Cardella, third degree BJJ black belt under Master Helson Gracie and owner and head instructor of Helson Gracie St. Augustine in St. Augustine, Florida. So welcome, sir, and thank you so much for taking time to uh, talk to me today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for your service. Happy Memorial Day. Oh, it thank went you. well for you. It went very well, and thank you for your, uh, your service as well. And I want to talk about that, uh, among other things, I know that sure. you've done a lot during your martial arts journey, and, and uh, we'll certainly get to as much of it as possible. But to get us started, Phil, I know you were the founder of, of Health and Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Associations in Texas, but have since yeah. moved over to uh, Florida, where you're the head instructor of Health and Gracie uh, St. Augustine. So uh, when did you make that move, Phil, and what led to that relocation for you? Well, I had done just about everything there was to do in Austin, Texas, where I created Helsin Gracie Austin. I started that facility and I needed to because I was training and wanting to compete and wanting to improve my game after I got out of the Marine Corps. I stayed in Hawaii a little bit and then I moved to Austin and there was only like one other blue belt in Austin at the time and I mean he was on the other side of the town and I wanted to train down south. He lived up north and yeah so I, I had to do something and you know Helsin suggested I started trying to just gather up who I could to train and I would drive up to see Carlos Machado in Dallas and supplement my training and get some good knowledge from him in tough roles. And I would compete up there. And um, then after I established my academy quite well in Austin, and uh, for a long time we have uh, had a you know house and visiting and, and coming to Texas and doing a lot of good stuff for us there. And uh, I built a lot of associations and aligned with the right people in Texas to really uh, get good training and. and uh, try to improve the Brazilian jiu-jitsu community and the martial arts community as a whole. So then after I kind of, man, I did everything there is to do in Austin, Texas. And I was, you know, as a someone that liked to surf and liked the salt water and wanted to live by the ocean and the beach, kind of missed it, you know, and wanted to do something new. And Daniel Morais was in North Florida and Jacksonville at the time. And Holland was in St. Augustine for a short period. That's Helson's uh, son. And, uh, you know, they, they had been in North Florida and, they kind of wanted some more support out here and they definitely wanted my leadership. And I stepped up and moved out here in like 2010 to try to organize things a bit better and, um, you know, add what I could to things. And I did that. And then, uh, you know, some things happened. Daniel ended up moving out of, uh, the state and went back to Brazil and started his own team with his brother. And, you know, he's doing real well now. He's actually in United Arab Emirates training there and, and traveling all over and doing great things. So I think it was for the better. And then, you know, I was here in St. Augustine and try to pick up some pieces after Daniel left and kind of gather up the, the crew in Jacksonville and organize things a bit for our state here in Florida for Helson. And yeah, so I did that. And, you know, uh, for me, I'm happy with the move. I, I'm sad to have left Austin, but at the time, it seemed as though everybody was willing to jump on top of each other and put an academy around the corner from each other, and I think it was limiting the success of everybody. So that being said, I wanted to move somewhere where there wasn't anybody right next door or around the corner. People, you know, just, just clean slate. It's kind of nice to have that instead of having some dysfunction. And I don't think it's healthy to have academies right on top of each other. I think it limits the success of everybody involved and it's a bit short minded. So instead of trying to kind of weed through some trash, I instead left that academy there and, you know, there was already a black belt established and several brown belts. And now out of that whole melting pot of people that I gathered up 
in Austin. Uh, a lot of good, I think, happened after I left, too. People kind of went where they wanted to, and Gracie Humaitai, uh, you know, was founded, and a lot of my old students are there, and they're now black belts and doing real well, and uh, Donald Park founded it, and he's my very, very good friend. He used to turn at my academy, but Helson didn't really have much... Um, he, he wasn't very welcoming with Donald and was very concerned because Donald was a Hoyler black belt and it just didn't work out right, in my opinion. Uh, Donald's a great friend of mine and always has been. And that being said, he didn't feel welcome on Helsing's mats when I wasn't there, and he wasn't. So that split happened, and then a lot of people were wanting me to uh, to come back to Texas pretty quick, but other plans were made, and it didn't happen as quick as I wanted. So I hunkered down here in Florida and did what I needed to and, and kind of rooted myself here without the supplemental income of going back to Texas to do seminars as much uh, off the bat and kind of uh, wasn't the plan that I had voiced and it's all good. It worked out for the for the long haul really. Uh, I just then ended up having to work hard here and uh, Garza then has helped me out with that as well because he put me on a really good army contract. I'm an army uh, combatives instructor and we bought the Fort Stewart team to the All Army tournament, and Garth uh, put me to work um, going up to Fort Stewart and training the soldiers with him, and, and we did such a great job for for that. And nice. uh, it was neat. Yeah, it was real neat. I worked with the Fort Bliss team and the Fort Hood team, and I worked with Camp Mabry some and the UT Austin ROTC club, trying to kind of step in and help where I could. But I think what they were hoping was I would live at Fort Hood. And, teach up there initially but man i don't know if he's ever been to colleen texas i wouldn't wish it upon very many people live there <laughs> i, I so. actually have i i love texas i lived in el paso i was in the army there in the third armor cavalry oh, regiment I'm at list. yeah yeah and i and i uh, spent a lot of time in um san, san antonio as well as a little time in san angelo but i've been all over texas i really enjoy it but yeah, it sounds like you did a lot there but then it was time to move on I mean, everything happens for a reason and uh such as life, it keeps us moving and keeps it interesting. So I didn't realize you had been in St. Augustine as long as you had. And um, time flies. Yeah. yeah. So first of all, St. St. Augustine, what a cool place. Um, I think interesting, it's, right? I, Everyone asks St. Augustine, why? Yeah, why St. Augustine? You know? Yeah. And I think yeah. it's considered the the oldest yeah. city in the in the states. It is. And for those yeah. who don't know who who are listening, uh, it's where Ponce de Leon's infamous Fountain of Youth is located. So just a fun little. Yeah, trip I drive by it every day. Oh, really? I drive right down that road. Oh, cool. It's gorgeous. I know the street. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. It's on the way to work. Yeah. So yeah. you, you mentioned your academy there. I, there's something on your mm-hmm. your website uh, that really caught my eye that I want to um, read to everyone that you say about your academy and, and it's uh you say our facility is a one of a kind it was built with both my efforts and my students it's the type of academy where people enjoy spending time egos are wiped from our ranks through guidance education and hard work each person that walks through the doors of the academy are ready to invest in themselves and their training partners the common goals of bettering each other as well as people and sharpening the physical movements of martial arts. So I love that. Tell me a little bit about that. Thank you. Well, you know, I think that every time people come to jiu-jitsu, they need to recognize truly what I think it is, is it is an investment in themselves. Whenever you step on the mats and you, you go and you go to work, you're you're there and, you know, it's it's a personal investment. It's it's a bit of stress relief. And, of course, all the great character skills that happen from training jiu-jitsu, like learning how to work under pressure, problem solving, multitasking correctly, uh, prioritizing and accomplishing not sweating the small stuff, uh, attention to detail. You know, I could go on and on about all those great character skills, you know, and and at bare minimum, it's going to make you tough and it's going to make you able to, uh, to persevere at minimum, you know, Mm -hmm. and survive and recognize what survival is. So it's true. And then, you know, some people, um, come just for themselves to train. And, and, you know, the thing is, is if you end up coming in and you don't motivate people to come and train with you, then maybe you're not going to have your best training partners. And if you don't invest in your training partners and you're a kind of selfish person, I don't think you're going to be uh, the right fit in our ranks because what I try to do is I try to build an environment where everybody can help each other. If if everybody helps each other uh, and someone's not getting it, they get picked up, dusted off and a swift kick in the correct direction. You know, (laughs) that that's every, everybody needs that at some point. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if if we do that every week to help each other, then I mean you're only going to help. You're going to get used to helping people, and uh, it'll help you. And it's a positive environment that we try to grow. And of course, you know, martial arts 
most of the time, the people that come in and train, other than those good character skills, they don't even need it. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. hardly, I mean, it's so rare that people get attacked. It does happen, of course. Um, I mean, I could be statistics off to you mm -hmm. about it. But that being said, uh, once you start training your awareness and the way you carry yourself and all that stuff puts in uh, motion a, a way of becoming not a victim and carrying yourself not as a victim and not giving opportunity for others. And um, so they don't get attacked as much. You know, I've had students early on have trouble and, and deal with stuff, but it's rare you get like a senior rank, like a purple belt getting like attacked or something like that. And uh, at that point, they have to still enjoy it because it is not easy to come in and train. You make a lot of sacrifices to get on the mat. You know, you could be at home eating bonbons, getting uh, your back rubbed by your wife or whatever. But, I mean, you come in and you commit to doing that hard work, and that is, takes a special person to be able to come in and do that. And yeah, if they're does. motivated, you know, if they're motivated by their, their training partners and stuff, it only makes that much, much easier, you know, because you got a standard to hold. You have uh, people holding you to standards, and you have people, you know, wanting you to perform, and, and chancing you to come back to train immediately the next day or, or double days or sometimes even triple days because we do classes sometimes uh, 6.30 in the morning and then noon and then at night as well. So, oh, wow. yeah. So that's very important, yeah. what you said, because, you know, I remember learning this from a lot of places, but what's standing out in my mind right now is the uh, Paul Vunak, the Enigma, the DVD a long time ago. It had two parts, and you can apply this to any arts. Obviously, the first part is building that foundation of, of core self-defense and being able to take care of yourself. And then after that, you want to stay in it the rest of your life. Of course, you can still work on the, the basics and the fundamentals, and you always should. You should never stop doing that. Yeah. But to keep it interesting and, and make it feel like you are continuously evolving and growing, it becomes more of a um, self-evolution and growth the rest of your journey. But, you know, you want to keep it interesting and fun, but you want to continue to grow. So a lot of it's self-defense, and then a lot of it's just self actualization i guess you can call it you know just growing and learning and i think uh, the right environment like you're describing really helps that along it's a personal thing but it's also a group thing when you're in the right environment with the right people so awesome yeah and you know anytime you're doing something that isn't easy support always helps mm -hmm. and if you have someone that whenever you're frustrated it's like hey dude i had that same problem and this is how i figured it out or yeah man this isn't easy and you know this doesn't make sense to you. And that's great because now you're working on an area that isn't in your comfort zone. Yes. This is the stuff you actually need. And if someone actually, you know, puts that in front of you like that, awesome. Sometimes a second voice of reason uh, is the best thing in the world for an instructor. I can, I don't know how many times I've said something to someone until I was, you know, repeating myself like a parrot. And then eventually they're ready to hear it. Yes. And then either I say it or someone else says it and then ding, it clicks. And if someone else says it, like the house will come and tell someone the exact same thing that I've been telling them, but now <laughs> they're ready to hear it. And that's it falls so into place, you know. And that's, I just laugh at this point because I've seen it so many times. You know, that that's so true with in class with students, but also even uh, with kids. I've seen it a bunch of times where you can say it so many times, but then either they weren't ready to catch it, you know, really hear it, or... Yeah. Yeah, or, or sometimes sure. it takes hearing it for someone else, and then they'll come and tell you sometimes, yeah. hey, look, yes, listen to what I learned. And you're like, yeah. okay, I've told you that about a hundred times, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yep. funny. So you're enjoying St. Augustine. I know you, uh, you're into surfing and spearfishing and things well, like that. So, sure. So you yeah, can, I'm enjoying all of Florida. Yeah, and you, and you have a fiancé. I do, yeah. we we uh, She's a blue belt under me. Uh, we moved from Austin. I met her in Austin, Laura soon to be Cardella, Laura Cardella. <laughs> um, she is my fiance. So yeah, we, uh, we met in Austin and, uh, hung out there and just had so much fun hanging out with each other that we ended up sticking together. And, uh, we weren't even looking for anything like that really at the time. And man, she wanted to come have a fresh start with me here as well. And we embarked on our adventure to Florida together. And, you know, we, we've really, uh, grown really strong together with, uh, the time and, and being a great team uh ourselves so it's been pretty cool really cool she yeah she's she's a great partner and an equal to me so awesome i know one, know, one cool thing about her we were talking a little bit earlier and and she teaches yeah. aerial aerial dance yeah, aerial, aerial yoga yeah and uh i was telling you my daughter who would be 10 next month anna she started doing aerial about four or five months ago and just absolutely loves it so if, if you uh for for anyone listening who don't know what that is, doesn't know who that is, can you just explain what that is a little bit? Absolutely. So what it is is 
basically um, fabric hanging from the ceiling that's extremely strong and rigged up to uh, to withstand twisting and turning and falling and dropping and all this. And girls get up on this fabric and either do, as you were saying, some yoga stuff. And Laura's actually a, has a good dance background, so uh, she's super flexible and coordinated and has dexterity for all the type of uh, dance stuff and yoga stuff. Yoga isn't super challenging to her. So that being said, she doesn't do as much of the yoga these days because it's not hard for her, even though it's good deep stretches and stuff on the fabric. It's not the same as the climb 35 feet up in the air, twist and roll herself up to where she'll fall, flip, turn, spin. And in and, and precision, the fabric will be a, a folded correctly, almost like origami of the fabric and land and boom sticker positions and poses and she'll be doing this stuff and make smiling while doing it like it's nothing but i mean she'll be up there sometimes 30 minutes straight doing all these intricate things you know and i mean i don't know how many people like that can like even just climb and like hold themselves up for you know five minutes much less yeah all the intricate stuff and it looks like it's nothing when she does it that is amazing so and she's the only one in St. Augustine doing it. Really? And, and she's, yeah, she's really, really dedicated to what she's doing. It's pretty cool. It's amazing. And we co-inhabit a facility that has 100% woman clientele doing aerial dance. And then, of course, since we have mats and crash pads and all that stuff for that, and it's above the mats at our jiu-jitsu facility, it's a great, it's a very unique uh, collaboration in the facility. It's That's cool. really cool. Very cool. Yeah. And for people who might, may not have a reference to this, uh, just think Cirque du Soleil, right? I think that's where, one of the first exactly, places some yeah. people saw yep. it. But it's really beginning. It's really catching on uh, all over now. And my wife and I actually did an intro class. They had a date night one night. You could do it, just go. And yeah. so we just went for one session. And it was like, man, it was challenging, but it was fun. It was, it was well, it's pretty no joke. cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, it is cool, right? Yeah, and definitely a, a good way to become coordinated and strong for sure. Absolutely. And, there's no joke. You got to get up there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. So, and you have a, yeah. a couple of dogs as well. Yeah. No kids, just dogs. Yeah. Bruiser. Dog, kids and your dogs. Dog with Kid. white footballs. <laughs> <laughs> they say when a woman asks for a puppy, get a puppy or you'll soon be buying diapers. <laughs> got a puppy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Good on that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's certainly good, good, that. good training for uh, someday having kids for sure. Because puppies sure, are a lot sure. of work when you initially get them for sure. Yeah, we we I don't know if we're gonna do kids. We're okay with being the kids ourselves. We, yeah. we enjoyed, as I was suggesting, travel and such. And right, right. I've done a lot of traveling, and uh, Laura is enjoying it as well. And I mean, we do weekend getaways. Like this weekend, we were gone in Tampa, and it was wonderful. And the weekend before, we were in Orlando, and uh, like a month or so ago, we were down in Miami. And you know, next uh, for sure, next month we're gonna go scalloping over in Horseshoe Beach, which is across the state. In Florida, with I mean, as long as traffic isn't bad, you can get all the way to South Florida pretty quick. In, in four hours, I can get down there. And I live in the bottom edge of North Florida. And to be able to be somewhere like Miami, I mean, it's it's a way different than the 12,000 uh, people town of St. Augustine, which is a very small infrastructure. Mm-hmm. It's, it's cobblestone roads downtown, way different, you know. And that's what we really enjoy about living in Florida is that we can – get on 95 and pipeline it down and be down in Orlando in an hour and a half or be in uh, Tampa in two and a half, three hours, be in Miami in four hours. Lionel Perez is down in Key West. and I can go down there anytime and see him and Eddie. And I mean, I don't know how, if you've ever been to the Keys, but it's gorgeous and I can drive yeah. there. It's, it's paradise. It's nice. When you said Eddie, yeah. who did you mean in, in uh, Key West? His brother, Lionel's brother, Eddie. Yeah. Eddie and Lionel are brothers and they're... So I met, I met Eddie... Uh, not quite two years ago, I was down to Key West, and I just looked up you know, BJJ, and I said, hey, uh-huh. I, yeah. that, that was him, and I went, uh, went and had a little conversation with him. Pretty cool. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, and tough. Lanky, tough, good build for jiu-jitsu for sure. Yeah, right on, right on. Yeah. So let's go back to your martial arts journey. Um, I know you shared some of it uh, as far as, you know, in Texas and everything, but how did you get started? I think your brother yeah. was in martial arts, and you kind of got into it because of that, <laughs> right? Was. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, what was – yeah, my brother Dave – he was doing Taekwondo with Chad Glisson. Uh, he started with someone named Chris first. And then after just like a month or so, he transferred over to Chris's instructor, Chris Fagan's instructor, Chad Glisson. And I trained with Chad and I started when I was like 12. What ended up happening, maybe 13. I was sitting at my brother's class because my mom would 
take my brother to class. And when he went to class, it was his thing, you know, and you know, my, my mom was like, no, that's for Dave. And I was watching class and I was like, huh, you know, let's think about this hour that he just spent that last hour. He was having more fun than me. That looked like fun. I wanted to do that. <laughs> and then my mom left me. Hey, you stay with your brother. I'm, I'm going to go do this or that. Some really thing, you know, or something. I was like, I don't want to go there. And she's like, well, stay here. I was like, all right, I'll stay and watch. And then I'm sitting there and I'm looking. I'm like, hey, hey, can, uh, can I practice? And they're like, yeah, yeah, come on. You know, and they got me out there, Chad did. And uh, man, from then, you couldn't keep me off, you know, out of training. I enjoyed it a lot. I thought it was fun. It was challenging. And uh, Chad Glisson is a, a very, very extremely unique person and uh, amazing person. He is actually the teacher that teaches all the instructors how to instruct at Chevron. Mm, all of Chevron, head instructor of all the instructors. So the guy might know a thing about instructing. And uh, he's a tough guy. He was, you know, he still is, no doubt. He's a master of lots of old traditional stuff, but he was the first one to tell me about the Gracies. And in his time, he was a pioneer, you know. Um, He was one of those guys that didn't stick you to one system. He he would uh, bring up and show you just everything he could. He he introduced me to jujitsu. He, um, back in the day, Wally J was running around doing stuff, and uh, he did small circle jujitsu. I actually met one of his nephews when I lived in Hawaii back in the day too, back in like '94 or something, or '95. And uh, I, I had first done that style of jujitsu, and then my instructor was like, "There's these guys," and I remember I remember being a pompous little 16 year old thinking, <laughs> "Who are these Gracie people?" Well, I would like to take the challenge, you know. <laughs> and then my instructor as well, "These guys are pretty good. You could." probably learn a thing or two from them. You might want to see what they're up to. I mean, they're, they're really shaping things. And at the time, you know, he would still have us do like judo throws and finish up on the ground and do stick fighting and do a little bit of hop keto and, and started uh, doing that stuff. And then he, he actually was like, Hey, this is what the Gracies are doing. Look at these things. Look at these positions. Here's, you know, a guillotine and arm bar. And my little brother who lived in Oklahoma, who grew up with Lovato Jr. Started, you know, they, they did a lot of jikundo and boxing and, then those guys, you know, were, were very early in the game. Lovato Sr. was training. Uh, you know, he's a great boxer, great Jeet Kune Do, kickboxing, all that stuff. And then he started training with the Gracies when they came around for seminars and chasing them around. And that was my little brother's mentor. And uh, my parents divorced. My little brother went with my mom. He was the only one that did. And he was in Oklahoma. And my mom got him involved with the Gracies and involved with Lovato and yeah, him and Lovato Jr. came up together and grew oh, up nice. together, and uh, yeah, very cool. And uh, that being said, my little brother would do seminars and stuff, and then he would share the techniques with me, and then uh, eventually he would, you know, share them with Chad too. And my little brother trained with Chad some while he was catching seminars and, and visiting and stuff like that uh, down in Houston area where I grew up, where Chad was from. And at that point, my little brother actually moved to Texas to graduate high school there with my dad and uh, stepmom. And he uh, he was telling me my little brother was when I was in the Marine Corps. Hey, man, you know, let's 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 start training this jujitsu stuff. And I was in boot camp. And I'm, yeah, it sounds cool. So I come home from boot leave, and I had done some training with my little brother, and you know, we just talked this and that. And we'd always we always had our garage set up for we had the heavy bag and uh, like three layers of carpet, so. We could train on it, either ground or, or kicking and stuff, and we would go out in the garage and fight, or the backyard, either one. We were no fighting in the house. Get in the garage, go out in the backyard, and that's where that was. would go down, sometimes front yard, too, and uh, we would get out there and do it, and uh, my little brother's like, hey, man, you want to go in the garage when I was home from boot leave? And that's code word for let's go outside and fight, and it's like, yes. Absolutely, I'm going to go outside. I just got done with Marine Corps boot camp. I'm going to sit there and I'm ready to go. Right. You know, and uh, yeah, for sure, that's the game. So we go out there, and uh, we ended up. You know, he's like, "Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's start like this. Grab me by the neck and, and put me on the ground, and you know, get over me and grab my neck and hold me tight. You know, try to choke me. Ready? Let's go." And then the arm bars just not on me. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I don't think he held back at all. I'm like, "Wow, well, come on, man." You know, he's like. Let's, let's go again. I was like, yeah, all right. You know, like when, but let's start like that again. I was like, well, I don't really like what happened last time. He said, yeah, but look, come on, man. Let's, let's, let's try from there again. And I'm like, all right. You know, so we go again, start from there again. Arm bars, just not out of me again. <laughs> and then uh, I'm like, 
nah, man, you know, I don't really want to, I mean, I, I kind of like the idea, you know, but I'd rather just start, you know, from here, uh, not from there, you know, yeah. but like, like maybe standing up or something and definitely not extending my arm. And he's like, well, what would you do from there? From where? And he's like, well, what if I had you down and I'm grabbing you by the neck and I'll beat your face in? I was like, well, I do that arm bar thing you did on me, man. My arm still hurts. So, I mean, I think that was probably a good answer for that, probably the best answer there is. He's like, yeah, well, that's jujitsu. I was like, yeah. He's like, well, you need to do more jujitsu. I was like, I know. He's like, well, you're about to go to Hawaii, right? And I'm like, yeah, probably. He's like, well, the meanest Gracie's out there. You should train with him. I was like, all right. You know, and, and eventually um, what funny. I did is I did guaranteed am tracks. Yeah. Yeah. The boot camp uh, leave was short and sweet, and my arm was sore for about a week. Wow. Uh, but you know, it was fun. One of those things. My little brother uh, definitely was the forefront in our family uh, trying to train. And you know, I have three brothers, all of which at some point trained. Uh, you know, and now me and my little brother train still. And my brother Dave still works out in conditions a little, but Nick and uh, Dave don't train as much as Steve and I. And uh, nonetheless, they're good, and they train some. So yeah, but. Man, I, I went to Hawaii and I went out there and Helson was there and there's a guy named Matt Spurlock who had a stepson that was training at the IEA Association of Helsons that was ran by Scott Devine, Mike Anzuka, Chris Anzuka, Rex, and a couple other people. And that was back when those guys were just purple belts. And I went out and uh, started training with them because there was the UH classes, which started way early and I couldn't get off of work and get out from the Marine Corps base on Kaneohe over there in time to start the class on time. So I couldn't do that one. So then I had to go across the island to train. And Matt Spurlock had a stepson that was training in IEA. And I went out there with him and started training there because those hours could work for me. And initially I carpooled with him a couple times until uh, I started figuring it out. And, you know, uh, when I started going, I was, you know, a young Marine and I didn't even have a car to start. So what I would do is I would find a way out with the bus system or, or, or hopping with someone that wanted to go into Honolulu and then from there figure it out. But there was no bus that would run from my yeah, back into Honolulu to get me back home. So every time that I would go to class, I didn't have an idea how I would get home until I finally got my beautiful 66 VW bug, which is a quote, reliable form of transportation. <laughs> if your brother's the brakes for it sometimes, uh, you know, but we, we made it work and I got out there and I always made it home and, and I, I would just know and I committed that I would show up. I don't care if I had to sleep somewhere and then That's get home right. the next morning, anything I would do it. And I would skateboard through IEA as a howly skateboarding through IEA, uh, at dusk. It's, it's, it's interesting. And I never had any problems or anything. And, uh, the people at Rainbow Gymnastics, where the IEA Association of Helsons originally was, were really nice. And the guys there, amazing group of people, hard nosed training, and just awesome. And uh, yeah, I started there, and then I was at the grand opening of Helsons' original academy on Cocoa Head. And yeah, it was pretty cool to see all the Gracies that were there and meet Elio for the first time. And was it 1995 or 96? And uh, it was pretty cool, man. I met uh, Carlene Nios, and I met. Obviously, Helson, uh, I'd already met him before, but he was there. And then Hoist was there, and Elio was there. And man, I think, like, I don't even know, several other people, though. It was pretty cool. Yeah, so I did that and then uh, trained at the main academy there some. And then after that, I, I ended up uh, moving, you know, uh, to Texas. So then I, I started really missing jujitsu, and I, I called Helson, you know, and I was like, what can I do, man? He's like, well, drive to Dallas and start training with Carlos to supplement your training and gather some guys and, you know, I can come see you sometime and, you know, there we go. So the first time Helson came to Texas with me was with myself and uh, a lawyer now uh, named Mike Rubin that is a purple belt now. Uh, but it was me and Mike Rubin that brought Helson for the first time into Austin to train and it was pretty cool. And yes. uh, from there, yeah, yeah, from there Helson really did pull me under his wing and uh, helped me out for many years and uh, you know I could stay at his house I still can I guess uh, but I could go stay at his house anytime and he would sponsor me for most of the time like half the plane ticket or hotel room or something just to get me to go to his competitions and if it was his competition uh, I was sponsored into the event and uh, you know man I, I really got after it when 9-11 happened I was the transportation manager at Austin area limousines and one of their head drivers and I was killing it at the time. But then nine 11 happened, high tech industry crashed. No one's flying anywhere. And all the high tech industries, the uh, companies that we as a corporate limousine company with a large fleet of vehicles were maintaining, didn't have enough work. So 
as the transportation manager, you can't let the drivers go hungry. So you keep them on the runs where the big money is so they can at least make it. And I have a secure office job. It just, my hours diminished. And I was like, you know what? This is a good time to take vacation. I'm going to go to Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it always sounds good, right? right. So, uh, I came out to Hawaii and we're doing, so we're going out there enjoying myself. And then there was a competition that I was going to do. So I went out there and did real well. And I won. I won the competition. I tapped out, I want to say 10 people, eight or 10. I don't remember, wow. but I won my weight and I won the open weight and did real well. You know, it was either my weight in the open. I think that's what it was. It wasn't no key, but I did my weight in the open. I won that. Then I went to Ohio from Hawaii. And, uh, then I, I wasn't even prepared though, you know, coming from Hawaii to Ohio, I didn't have Ohio clothes from Hawaii. I didn't plan on it, but I went out to Hawaii and, or from Hawaii to Ohio to compete in Helsinki's nationals that, uh, were hosted at the Ohio University um, there in uh, Columbus. And I, I won that as well. And then I went back to Hawaii and I was like, man, I really like this competing and I'm really, you know, I'm doing well. And I mean, it was tough competition in uh, Hawaii and Ohio. I mean, Hawaii, everyone's warriors, man. And Ohio, talk about a bunch of mean wrestlers, tough guys, you know, and to do well at both of those places, I was like, man, maybe I kind of you know bite down on this a little bit more and see where it takes me so i really started pushing to do competition as much as i could and, and really focused on being a, uh, a tough athlete and and really trying to get better and i went to i went on a rampage of tournaments you know anything i could get in that was competition i would do it and then me and that guy mike rubin uh he said to me he's like hey phil there's a tournament this was in 1999 there's a tournament down in, in corpus christi called the battle of the beach and Alvis Solis hosted it, and he was like, uh, you can do jiu-jitsu there. All right. I was like, all right, all right. And then they're like, hey, man, I heard there's a there's a division where you can hit people too. I was like, well, sign me up. <laughs> you know, so that was the first time I did MMA, and it was interesting to do that on a flat mat, and it was not called MMA at the time. It was like the Valley Tudo division. Yeah. So we did that, and then, yeah, it wasn't MMA. It was, I remember it wasn't back when it was known as that. Valley. Yeah, and then I, I did the Powell County Expo. I did that as well, which was another one. I was at this at work, and this guy came up to me, and he was like, hey, uh, so there's these fights, and they're in Belton, Texas. That's near Waco. And I was like, really? Tell me about them. He's like, well, I ain't going to do them. What are you, you know? I was like, what do you mean I'm not going to do them? Oh, I'm going to do them. I'm going to go in. <laughs> I thought about it, and I was like, I don't have to go do it. You know? Right, so right. I went, and I did the Bell County Expo. It was an openweight uh, pro-am tournament, and uh, – I won it. And uh, once again, you know, I thought, man, maybe there's something to this. So, you know, I really stayed hungry to compete and I kept seeing victories. So I continued with that and got uh, the ability to test my combative efforts and my competition efforts against, you know, the best people I could. I was trying to compete against all I could. And in that rampage, I ended up competing as a blue belt in uh, Nogi open weight tournament during the day and then that was in Biloxi, Mississippi at the casino at the Beau Rivage and then at night I competed against uh, Adriana Lucio uh, two-time Brazilian world champ and uh, did well I went to a draw with him he, you know I'm a blue belt he's a black belt uh, he got some position on me and stuff wow. but couldn't catch me or didn't catch me I don't know but I did well I thought I did well yeah. um, and it was a draw so that being said I, I really felt like hey man you know maybe I could be world class at this stuff so I just really bit down even harder and, and kept going after it. And then I remember as a purple bell, I went on a rampage and I, I closed out the Texas state championships winning. I tapped everybody out at the uh, Arnold's. I tapped everybody out at the, the, oh, what did I do with the pans? I don't know. Um, no, as a blue belt, I did the pans and I got, um, I got third and it was good brackets. I tapped everybody out and then I got to where I hit the metal round and, it wasn't the best match, man. Guys taking his gear off, timers running out, stalling and all this stuff. And I was kind of over it. Uh, they let the guy take the gear off like seven times during the match and the gear didn't fit anyway. And I was just like, you know, this is stupid, but whatever. Um, I did that. And then I did a lot of other tournaments and did well at the Arnold's the nationals, the, uh, Texas state championships and all that stuff. And I would always try as a, a season blue belt to fight up to the purple if I won the blue. So I was getting all the experience I could and, you know, just a, a bit down, uh, Saul Solis started hosting fights in Houston. He started with Party Slam, and then he went to Renegades Extreme Fights, and I fought in those. And so did a lot of other good people, including like uh, Pete Spratt, Eves Edwards, Carlo Prater, all these tough monsters, Tim, 
Tim Crater. There you go, mm-hmm. Crazy Tim Crater. Yeah. He was in it. Dave Phillips was in it. A lot of tough dudes. And uh, there was there was really some some remarkable stuff going on in Texas at the time. And you know, uh, we we have world class things going there. You know, you look at Texas Jiu Jitsu now; it's really really grown. And uh, my goal in doing competition was to prove my style of of you could say mixed martial arts, and of course, prove that Jiu Jitsu. Uh, and Helsin's Jiu-Jitsu primarily is extremely effective for finishing fights and winning. And in a combative mindset, I believe that people need to know it. And so I would go apply a Jiu-Jitsu in fights and go and tap people out. And I uh, did that Gino Gi and mixed martial arts for a lot of years. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Well, you certainly took yeah. it all to a, a high level, not only in Jiu-Jitsu, MMA, but but all of it. So much respect yeah, to you. Yeah, I, I mean, I did. Thank you. A lot of people uh, act surprised whenever they're like, They'll ask me, you know, they'll look at me and like, because I teach with a gi on, and I suggest everyone should train some with a gi on, so you're not ignorant to it. And same with the no gi, um, and you know, with stripes. But people look at me like it's crazy that I teach no gi as well. Like, really? I was like, yeah, man. You know, I've done as much no gi competition as I had gi, and I've really, I've done a lot of MMA. I did it before it was, uh, like, I started my first MMA bouts, which was NHB in Valley Tudo in '99, and then I ended up, I want to say like 2010 was the last. Uh, thing I did, I did the shark fights and WEC and GFC and all that stuff during that time period. And then at that point, when the WEC is done, I mean, everybody in the UFC in the lightweight division, Eves Edwards, who trained out of my academy in Austin, Roger Huerta, who trained with us some too. Um, man, those guys are in that division. Uh, Nate Diaz was in that division. And I had just left training with him in Stockton, I whatever. Uh, they have their academy in Lodi. And I was there and I, I ran some classes with them and trained there and got great training from Caesar. Uh, he, they welcomed me in very much so. And uh, it was great, you know, but it was him and Kamal and all these other people in the division. It's like, well, why do I need to be in that division? Right. Um, let those guys run with it. And in my, I was like 39 at the time and stuff. I mean, what do I need to do? My, my elbows were already flat from bouncing them off people's heads. And, <laughs> eh, you know, I, I was teaching a lot too. So. Yeah, and you know, teaching a lot, man, you got to focus on your students. You can't mm-hmm. be as selfish. A competitor must be selfish at some point. Right. You have to, instead of answer questions, like, you know what I, I really disliked about having to fight and teach and all that stuff? A lot of the times you play 20 questions and it would fatigue you just even having to answer these stupid questions over and over and over. Everyone wants to have that shop talk with these three questions. When's your next fight? How much do you weigh? How do you feel? Who's your opponent? You know, like, man. Just leave me alone. I don't even want to talk about my weight. I just want to come in with headphones on and warm up and get my training and then go home. That's the ideal thing for someone that's preparing for competition, you know? And in my opinion, and or at least where I was in my, my life, I figured just those things would be the best things for me to come in and not have to fatigue myself with small talk, get in, train hard, and get after it and, and uh, disengage from anything that did not pertain to you getting better mm-hmm. for that event mm-hmm. someone wants to ask ask me a question i don't want to answer it. you know what i want to do instead jump rope somebody wants me to show a move move not i don't even want to show a move i only want to do a move a thousand times to get sharper at it right. and i don't want to talk about my weight because it's fine how do i feel i always feel fine i always feel ready there's no re- reason for me to repeat these stupid same answer thing i actually wrote a big thing on the wall at my academy at one point with all the information and then i would only just point at it and shake my head. Like, no, I'm not talking about it. Because if I sit here and I talk to you about it, I should be jumping rope. I should be shadow boxing. I should be doing 100 arm bars. You know? Right. And uh, yeah, so that was kind of yeah, well, at the point where. Yeah. When, you, when, you, when you're going for something, you know, that high level, you, you really do have to have you know, single, singleness of mind and, and total focus. So anything that's perceived as a distraction can, I'm sure, be very frustrating. I was going to ask you what's, your, what's been some of your biggest challenges over the course of your BGJ MMA journey, but that sounds like one of them there. Could you share a couple balance of... Balance of life. What's that? Sure. I said the balance, balance of, of life, life yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Can you share um, a couple and, of uh, and, your biggest lessons you've learned through your journey just uh, in general that come yeah. to mind? Yeah. For me, um, man, I would say like trying to figure out the big picture theories to apply early on. Um, you know, if you learn theory of martial art, you can apply it. And I didn't get that. I think I went into jujitsu with a traditional martial art mindset, a hard-nosed blinders on type approach to thing, uh, things. This is the way you do it. That's it. Blah, you know, and, and no, no, no. 
you actually need to learn theory. And if you can apply the theory to it, then you can answer your own questions. And learning on my own some, uh, I mean, I had a lot of great guidance, don't get me wrong. But when I lived in Austin, I would have to figure out a lot on my own. And I mean, I was traveling all over to learn stuff, but I was the resident expert in Austin, Texas for Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And that, that meant that if I didn't have Helson there right now, I would have to figure things out. And he helped me uh, start learning theory and just rules of jujitsu, like don't put your hands on the mat in the guard, you know, or, or two arms to one side, you know, the person's going to take your back if you do that in their position. Little things, you know, just that are theories. Imagine you learn jujitsu theories and then you start applying them and they start answering your own questions. So that was an epitome for me at one point. I, I started to answer my own questions and that meant that I actually knew something yeah. and I was able to apply things and answer stuff that, that would make my jiu-jitsu grow that were sticking points. So, you know, that helped me. And then jiu-jitsu at some point is going to make you patient, you know, because there are things you're not going to be good at and, you know, you're going to have to work at them because you need them. And even if it's not your strong point, you have to be patient and put your nose to it and keep doing the correct thing that you're trying to improve at again and again and again until you can do it with 100% resistance or, or be able to apply it and learning to be really comfortable in adversity to keep a calm mind and to think your way out and to apply theory um, you know and in a tough spot you know and and to welcome being put in that tough spot to later become better at it. that was some stuff that that I had to figure out and made me much, much better as a person, I think, because if you can look at adversity and laugh at it and then tighten up, pull up the doors, tighten the belt, take a big breath and get it, you know, if you're able to be that kind of person that can look at adversity and do that, you know, you're, you're a strong, of strong character. And I think jujitsu gave me that. And I think that not giving up uh, and applying jujitsu theory to what I was doing would help me. And of course, just in general, being able to like look at adversity and, and kind of get down and, and, and jump at it with like a, like a rat on a Cheeto, get after it, you know? Right. And, uh, it's tough. It's tough, you know? And really, I think like the theories and applying it and, and learning how to work in adversity and having patience and all that would, would be the biggest lessons I learned. I definitely learned you can bite off more than you can chew. You know, I, I've also seen that life isn't fair. Um, tournaments aren't fair either. And sometimes you sleep well the night before and sometimes you don't. And, Sometimes that'll affect things and sometimes you'll be able to grunt through it and, you know, it, it just builds character. And I think that, you know, humility is taught. I've definitely had some, some, some tough roles and some tough stuff where I was just like, you know, frustrated, but, uh, you know, you, you grow from that. And when you're in frustration, I think that mm -hmm. you need to welcome the, the circumstance to, to know that you're at least challenging yourself. Nice. And that's very important in life. Yeah. Love that. Love that. So what do you consider to be your biggest uh, accomplishments uh, or what, what are you the most proud of so far with everything that you've done in your journey? The most proud of thing, I guess, would have to be the fact that I've helped as many people as I have. I've given uh, people that, that have been attacked an ability to defend themselves. I've, I've had women come up to me and say, hey, thank you. You know, I really needed my jujitsu and it, it helped me and, and it saved me. You know, I've had people do that. I've had you know, people, law enforcement come up to me after having been in some real weird stuff and tough circumstances and humbly come and, and, and uh, tighten up their game and, and get to where they can go to home and sleep at night with the cartel having a hit on their head. I have met and trained kids that have been seen their parents execution style killed in front of them. Mm -hmm. I've met those kids and I've trained with them and, and tried to, to help them. Last month, no, uh, two months ago, uh, April is women and children abuse awareness month right and uh i did at the end of the month i did a seminar at unf for a bunch of women empowerment groups and helped a whole bunch of young ladies uh, high school gals and stuff like that and uh, college students as well and i think that doing that kind of stuff even if you know they're not your permanent student all the time like the kids that i've seen come up and become just great people like Sawyer Morris. That's, that's one, uh, people like that though, man, I've, I've definitely had people come to me later and tell me, Hey man, thank you so much. I have a student named Gavin and, uh, Gavin's dad is bipolar and is alcoholic and attacked Gavin one day was trying to kill him. Bipolar just had a really bad day. And he, uh, he used jujitsu to kindly 
escape, survive, and not mm. injure his dad. Wow. And I mean, the kids, you know, like he he had coof and control and compassion, and, and you know, yeah. I mean, that's the kind of thing that I want to see. Just like um, you know Sawyer Morris, man. That's 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 an amazing individual. I had him from like little bitty, little fiery little redhead kid coming in from San when he lived in San Marco. San Marcos, he came up and would train with me, you know, driving half an hour into Austin to come train and seeing him go up through the ranks and to see him become who he is these days. You know, he, he was like probably the first person from Texas to get a full ride scholarship at a major university for wrestling, like one of them. You know what I mean? He's probably, I know he's the first one at Indiana State to go and get a full ride scholarship. And he only wrestled in high school. So his jujitsu before that, and and Grant Westlake High School had amazing wrestling coaches, but his hard training was with Kamal Shalarus, Rowdy Lundgren, Ryan Larson, you know the list goes on. Scott Lord, Justin Dyer, all these people trained him at my facility, and we had Daryl Golar there at my facility for a while. Wow. Uh, uh, Iranian national team teaching, uh, Iranian nas- wrestling national team wrestler teaching. I mean, these dudes were monsters. And yeah, it's we hardcore training. And got him, yeah, and he got a full-ride scholar. He earned himself wow. a full-ride scholarship and state champion and all this other stuff, you know, just doing it through high school, which is hardly, it, it's unheard of almost, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, to have that type of positive impact on people, amazing. And to give people a purpose and in, in something to work hard for and ways to invest in themselves, a positive stress relief, you know, all that. Those are my greatest accomplishments. And if someone wants, in a nutshell, what is the greatest accomplishment you've done? I'll say, look at my students. Mm. That's the greatest accomplishment, man. Yeah. I've helped thousands of people. I got to train so many soldiers that have been to battle and back. Uh, I got to train Staff Sergeant J.J. Chapa's guys. That's part of the 4th ID. Those are the guys that caught Saddam. I got to train them at – I volunteered my time to do that at Camp Mabry before they deployed. You know, I've trained a lot of people at Bliss, Stuart, Hood – so many soldiers come around from all over and find me and come train and uh, to know that I've helped them is, is huge. That's when nine 11 happened, I wanted to jump back in the military, but I didn't know a absolute direct opponent to go after. So I thought, you know what, man, I'm going to train the civilians. I think that's where we need to focus our strength. And I started, you know, uh, really focusing on that. And I found a purpose in that. So, you know, helping, helping and helping the community as a whole, is my greatest accomplishment. I've done some cool stuff in competition. You know, I mean, anybody that goes and taps out eight to ten people in a weekend, yeah, like, say. Yeah, and, say. yeah, winning open divisions, uh, being held up over someone's head with this 260-pound guy lifting me, trying to slam me, and I spin around and choke him like kicks <laughs> on, you know, oh, in, you know, in pride. Cool. You know, like I got to do that. And when the guy, 260-pound dude, lifted me up over his head, I was like, what would Hickson do? All right, spin, spin, oh, land wow. with a turn. Yeah, you know, stuff like that, man. Amazing. I got to fight in front of my dad. I've got to fight in front of my my fiance. I've got to go to Vegas and fight in the bright lights of Vegas. I've I fought in open weight tournaments of 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 like the toughest dream team divisions and grappler quest and lightweight grappler quest tournaments and you know so many tournaments, man. I've won the belt at Naga two times in a row. And I've, I've you know I've done everything I could in competition. Fought and represented Helson from. Uh, you know, the whole time, and, and he created the GFC back in the day, and I fought and I won in both of those big shows, and that was another, uh, for a long time, a dream of mine and stuff, and um, in general, to just test my ability as a combative-minded person to be able to do that, it's cool. Absolutely. Man, You've you, yeah. life sure has been an adventure for you so far, it sounds like. I you've feel like I've so lived much. a lot of lives. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's very cool, yeah. and, and the yeah. lives that you've yeah. impacted, that's the coolest part so yeah you certainly have my respect before we close anybody you want to yeah. shout out to i know there's probably been a lot of people in your background but anybody that you want to do a quick shout out to and there's so many people that have helped me i, I mean to, to to limit it would be horrible sure um and i've had so many black belt friends so many instructors so many people be good to me and throughout the years daniel morris has been amazing holland health and uh, carlos machado Man, all the people in Hawaii, man, that's where I came up originally. And I go back there when I put it all the time back to the uh, purple belt and brown belt and all that stuff. Those people know the uh, the meaning of Aloha. People like Cesar Oliveros and uh, Helson's ex wife's family, Uncle Mike, That that's part of the, uh, he's like the mayor of Hanalei and so nice. We want to get married in front of his house at the beach. So I better say hi to him and Keanu. No. Uh, man, thanks, Elio. I appreciate it, man. I'm, I'm you know, representing him and Helson. So, and man, all my students, all the people that believed in me, my dad, he sponsored me some for a while, gave me tickets, gave me this stuff. My stepmom, 
you know, she uh, she encouraged me to the martial arts and really was the one that got my brother into it as well. So without her, I wouldn't have been able to do that. You know, Helson's done opened so many doors for me in the past and stuff. I don't have as tight of a relationship these days as I used to with him, but you know, life continues and uh, still has a lot, I have a lot of respect for him and stuff. But man, everybody that's helped me, it would be impossible to shout sure. out to them all. Sure. But you know, I've had I've had many opportunities to try to. Hold down Eve's Edwards, it made me better. Uh, Daniel Mice making me pass the guard, uh, making me tough in my guard, and you know, that helped me. You know, they put up with me. Yeah, so got so many good people around me. That's that's one thing that I do is I invest in people, and right I'll do anything for anybody. You know, that's a good person, and so many people have done so much for me that I'm just fortunate to have the people that I do in my life. Right on, man. Well, I want to thank you um, for opening up and sharing, you know, more about your life and letting us all get to know you better. So I really appreciate it. My hat goes off to you for everything you've done and all the lives you've impacted. So thanks so much and uh, keep doing what you do, man. Long, healthy life to you, brother. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll, I will try to fester this earth as long as I possibly can and make uh, good positive impacts on lives too. Yeah, right. I feel it's my calling to help people. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. All right. Thank you, man, and uh, be well. Yeah. Okay, really enjoyed speaking with Phil. Up next is the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. success to me is, you know, it's living the life that you want to live and realizing that like, hey, everything's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be pretty all the time. I mean, there's going to be some like rough times, but the question is like, are you really living your full life? You know, what, what other latent dreams and things have you put on the back burner and that you want to go out there and you want to experience, you know, and are you letting that fear, you know, of, of the poverty mentality of like, oh, there won't be enough or the scarcity, you know, like, are you allowing that to go and cloud what you know, what your vision is for your life. Why would you hold on to something and spend a significant portion of your life doing something that you absolutely hated? We're getting to that point where a lot of people are waking up. You know, a lot of people are waking up to the fact that they can go and do anything that they want. And also, too, that, you know, the true life, I think the, the biggest impact you can go and make is helping somebody else. I think a tremendous amount of freedom that comes when you decide to, like, live life on your terms. I mean, what is our life aside from the way in which we interpret it. You know, we can make things go and mean so many different things. And when you're caught up in that victim cycle and the excuse making, then you perpetuate more of that. And it continues to go and pull you down deeper down that path until all of a sudden it's like, you're so consumed by those excuses and the victimization that like you can't actually see potential. Then I think once you pull out of it, you know, you, you start to go and get like a glimpse of what you can do, what can be possible in your life. Do you want more of that? There's, way more to life out there than my freaking checking account. You know, there's way more life out there than, like, what kind of car I'm driving. Like, it's nice to have nice stuff, but, like, past a certain point, it really doesn't change your experience of life that much at all. You know, if your basic needs are met, you're doing all right. What are you passionate about? You know, what do you really want to go and do to the world? Who do you want to go and be? Who do you want to go and help? The experience of life that we're on, I mean, it's, it's incredible. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. Hope you're enjoying the show. If you feel like you're benefiting from the show and want to show your support, you can support us on our Patreon page in the link in the show notes. Please like and follow us on social media and help us spread the word by reposting our posts and telling others about the show. You can leave comments on the website at www.racyjujitsurocks.com. You can also go to iTunes and leave comments as well as rate the show. And we would appreciate a five-star rating, which helps us with our standing in iTunes. You can also leave comments on our YouTube channel. If you have suggestions for the show, please don't hesitate to give those. We always like feedback and suggestions. Okay, that's going to do it. So until next time, 
This is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat. <laughs>